Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, top I got a top 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. And men. All my life. It's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty, and my take on his top 50 rules for success. Enjoy. If while you're writing your book, if while you're recording your podcast, if you're sitting there going, I hope this is going to be number one. This better be number one. I hope I sell more copies than this person. I hope I sell person. more copies than this person who's launching at the same time because that's the only way. Well, guess what? Now the quality of your output right now has just dropped. Mm. Because guess what? You're now living 75% in the future and you're 25% right now. And guess what? This 25% is gonna define that future goal and result. And your happiness. And your happiness. Whether you get the result or not. Totally. Whereas for me, when I was writing my book, and of course I want my book to be a best-selling book. Of course I want my podcast to do well. Of course, we don't do anything for it to be lost, like no yeah. one does that. But what I do know is that when I'm creating, when I'm producing, when I'm writing, that's all I'm doing. See, the truth is that only 2% of the world's population can multitask. Now the crazy thing is when- Who are those 2%? When 2%, when, when people hear that, they think, oh, I'm in that, oh, I'm in that 2%. <laughs> like everyone thinks that, that they're in that. But most of us are the 98%. Yeah. And the truth is there is no such thing as multitasking. What it is, is fast switching between two tasks. So yes. the quality is just dropping. Because you can actually, you cannot do two things at one time. You cannot. No one genuinely can do two things at once. I guess you could maybe like pat your head and do this at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you but, can't but, do something productive at the same time, right? Or creative. And yeah. so what I'm saying is that when you're sitting here going, this needs to be number one, you are reducing that thing's ability to be number one because it now yeah. doesn't have your full focus. Right. So, so that's the difference maker, that you can want to be number one, there's nothing wrong with that, but you can't keep comparing what number one is to someone else's goal too because everyone's got a different trajectory. Like there are some people that are kind of come in and do really well at one thing and you're gonna do really well at another and that's why competition has to first be in your space. Mm. Like don't compete in a space that's not yours right? because now you're just trying to be someone else again and you get a lost identity. in that identity. A exactly. Identity. exactly. I'd literally experimented with everything with my health, even as a monk, and I tried week-long fasts, and I'd pushed myself without sleep. I used to sleep like four to six hours a night, and I got to a point where I was like, I need to take care of my health. I, I need to make my health a priority, because I was so fascinated about mastering the mind that I almost neglected the needs of the body. And I can definitely say that I got to incredible places with my mind, but at the expense of sacrificing my caretaking of my body, and I felt I wanted to go back and do both of them together. A lot of my friends will say, Jay, you always look like you've got something exciting going on in life. And I'm like, yeah, I do. But that's because like nine people told me that my other ideas sucked, <laughs> right? And so like I've, I get more wins because I get more failures. Because I'm failing so often, I'm trying so many things out so often that don't go right. And then everyone sees the one thing that goes right. And that's how it works. And that's the odds for anyone. That's not just me. Anyone who's doing what they love every day is trying a hundred different things, and most of them are not working. But because they're playing the game of numbers, something's gotta work. Like, that's how I live. I'm just like, if I try 10 things this year, one of them's gotta work. But if I try one thing this year, most likely it probably won't work. Right. And that's the biggest challenge. If we just up our experiments, <laughs> it, like, you gotta you know, do something new for every weekend this year. The way I see it is that competition in and of itself is not good or bad. And, and this is like the monk mindset on 99% on of things, that this mug is not good or bad. It could be filled with water or it could be filled with poison. Yes. And so competition, I'll give you an example. Yeah. As monks, our competition is in how much love and respect we show to each other. That's your competition? Like that's what you compete on. Or how, so, how long can we meditate for? No, no, no. So, <laughs> I so can meditate a, longer than yeah. you. So if any monk is sitting, and I did this plenty of times. Really? If I sat there and I thought, oh yeah, look at him. He's scratching his back. He got uh, out. Like he that, moved. Your meditation <laughs> just got destroyed. Right? <laughs> All the value. And so monks will never ask how long you meditate. They focus on how deep you meditate. And someone who meditates mm -hmm. deep doesn't go on about how deep it was. Right. But, but you compete for showing respect. 
You compete for serving each other. You compete for how well you can collaborate. Mm-hmm. And I feel like you live this. Yes. Like yes, I, I, yes. I feel like you have no, this. I didn't you used to do that. Yeah. But the last but seven you do years, that now. I got like course. you think like a monk. Like I feel like we're always trying to find a way where we can be better friends to each other support and support each other. Each other. Yeah. And so you're competing on that. And, and that's a positive competition that I think you can have. So you can still use, and this is the beautiful thing about the monk mindset, you can use any yeah. thing in a positive way. Hey everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, people with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth, happiness, and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So. Whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Build to Serve by Evan Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. Everyone you love and respect and look up to, that's been their path. And I think that's what's given me so much, that's what's liberated me from it. Like Steve Jobs is one of my biggest role models in, in certain areas of his life. And when I've read his autobiography, uh, his biography, sorry, by Walter Isaacson, it's like the guy has failed so many times. Yet all of us, like most of us, have a phone that's an iPhone or an Apple product in our home or whatever it is. It's like he's not worried about all those times that went wrong because it, he obviously won big in, in this area of his life. So my takes just everyone you look up to, whether it's an athlete, an entrepreneur, a coach, a CEO, whatever it is, they have messed up so many times. I just know that. So when you're messing up, you're on the path. Like you're on the same path, right? And and I, yeah, I encourage people to share what they're failing at too, because it just helps. Something that happens is you have to surround yourself by peers in a space too who understand you and don't see you as competition. And that's really hard and it's like a fine line. I genuinely believe that collaboration wins always. So I, my whole approach to most things has always been, hey, I want to collaborate with you. Whether I'm bigger on social media or smaller on social media, I'm just like, I just want to work together because I think that's going to win long term for all of us. Both, not just in terms of success and numbers, but more in terms of, I want to be friends with you. And so I reach out regularly to people that I admire in different ways. And I reach out to them and say, hey, I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to connect. I'd love to be a friend. Like, not I'd love to for you to teach me how you do this. And if that comes naturally from that relationship, amazing. If it never evolves into that, I've just got a great friend who now gets me. So I try and make friends in two areas. One is in an area of people who understand my life because I feel the conversations you can have with someone who does exactly what you do are just so great because they already get you, right? And uh, someone that I had on my podcast lately, her name's Lily Singh, Superwoman. Uh, She's become a recent friend. She's been incredibly and is incredibly successful on social media. She's using her platform for doing amazing good in the world. And she was someone I reached out to because I was just like, hey, like you've been doing all of this for a while. You started on YouTube a lot longer than I did. And I would just love to connect from you and hear from you. And she's become an incredible friend. And we've just been sharing ideas and learning together. And it's like that relationship's awesome. And then at the same time, I'm trying to find people who are not in media. So I still have friendships with the monks back in India. And I just spent January in India for a month. I was meditating again for, for roughly about 21 days. And I have them in my life because they remind me of like the roots and they remind me of the truths that bring me back. So I kind of like both. I love people who totally get my space. And usually those are people I reach out to. And then I love having my roots down. So most of my inner circle now is from people I've reached out to or they become people who've been reaching out to me for a long, long time and have been consistently reaching out to me asking for nothing. I'd say I was quite rebellious and independent even as a monk. A lot of part of a monk's life is conforming and accepting authority and following a path. And those are all beautiful things for people 
who, who, who like those things. For me, it was a great training ground and a great system of giving me abilities and skills and habits that I didn't have before. But then I really felt a deep calling in my heart to want to share this in a specific way. So I, I kind of feel dragged to do what I do now because it's so deeply in me to want to make things relevant, non-sectarian, universal, and accepting of all truths and paths. It's just, it's just there and I can't ignore it. And I got to a point in my monk life where I just felt I, I can't ignore this desire to want to go and spread this wisdom and insight in a way, independently, in a way that I feel will work and help people, you know, from an impact point of view. And so that was a big part of it. The challenge is that we think things come with emotions. Feelings. We think things come with feelings and emotions. And guess what they don't. So if you chase money. Well, they might for a moment, right? Or they won't. I don't think they even do. It's, a false sense it's of such feeling. a false sense of feeling. I don't. Uh -huh. Maybe for a moment, but it's so short-lived that it's it's not even worth counting almost. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you when you think that I'm chasing money. Guess what? You will get money. Yep. And that's great. Money is really important. Money is a really important resource. But guess what? Money's not now going to fill that gap, that void, that feeling, that emotion that you're missing in your life. What are and most so, people missing? We're missing a deep sense of love. I think, I think the biggest need in the world, as we've heard many times before from all the ancient texts, they, they, they summarize it like this, to love and be loved. Like that is the need of humanity, to love and be loved. And when we don't experience that, we then start looking for status. We then start looking for money. Then we then start looking for recognition. To, to help us give the feeling of false sense of love. Correct. And the challenge is because most of us didn't experience that from our parents, and this is the key thing, what we crave in life is what we did or didn't get from our parents. Mm -hmm. What our parents did give us is what we continue to crave, or what they didn't give us is what we continue to crave. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that most people's love languages that they chase are things that their parents didn't give them. So if their parents didn't give them time, they now crave everyone's time. If their parents didn't give them gifts, gifts they crave gifts. If their parents didn't give them acts of service, they, they're craving those acts of service. So it's because of our childhood. And if we don't learn to process all of that experience, mm. which most people never get the time to do, and, and I empathize with that because I've had to go through that. I've seen me repeating my parents' patterns. Mm. I've what seen was the me, thing you were craving? So I would crave a big thing for me was I would crave surprises and gifts because that's your thing. Yeah, yeah. that's my thing. Still is your thing. It's still my thing. Yeah. And and I did your parents not do that for you? No, or? they did. A, my mom did a lot of it. That's why so, you still crave. Correct. It. So my mom would always every year on my birthday, she'd always surprise me with the one thing I wanted. And I wasn't spoiled growing up. I didn't yeah, have a yeah. lot growing up. But she would get that one thing, whether it was like a Power Rangers toy right. or whether it was whatever it was. You yeah. know, something. You Video know, game. Yeah. Or something thing like. is, you want as a kids, right? And she would always surprise me with that. And that became so deep rooted. Now I'll give you an example. When I then married my wife, you just expect people to know that. That they're gonna do the same thing. Totally. And, and so she now- She didn't you, do that. No, because I'm expecting my wife to be like my mom in the sense of I expected a surprise or show me love in the same way. Uh -huh. And she doesn't know that. She's not a mind reader. I can't explain, expect her to know that. So it took communication. It took yeah. time for me to explain that. So anyway, th I think that's where it stems from, that desire it doesn't come from any, you can say it comes from society and education, of course it does, but I think the deepest place it comes is what your parents did or didn't give you. Mm -hmm. That's that's where yeah, it comes from. Yeah. I've seen some stories about some phenomenal Paralympians, I've seen some phenomenal stories about human beings who without arms and legs have achieved extraordinary feats. And this blows my mind because I always think like, it's. Some of us have challenges in different areas, but imagine being born without legs or arms or, you know, like actually not having stuff that we all take for granted. But those are like, for some people, that would be an absolute dream to have that. Now through robotics and bionic limbs, they can have that. But for years they've lived without it, but still seen, I've seen positivity in them. I've seen drive in them. I've seen a desire in them to achieve something phenomenal. So it's amazing what's happening out there. And we really have to connect with those stories rather than living in our small bubble. And often because we only live in our small bubble, we talk to the same people. Right, one of the biggest challenges with Envy is that we talk to the same people and they talk to each other. So our group is so small that we only hear the same stuff and we kind of start living as if that bubble of life is real. A young boy once asked his teacher, what's the difference 
between I like you and I love you? The teacher beautifully answered, well, it's like a flower. If you like a flower, you pluck it. But if you love a flower, you water it and nurture it daily and watch it grow. There is such a thin line between like and love. And because of it, we make so many mistakes in our relationships. When we want something in the moment, we take it and don't think any further. We do whatever we want to get that feeling of pleasure, not realizing that we're neither satisfied by that pleasure and nor will that thing last. When we pluck a flower, not only will that flower die, but we can't experience it for any longer than that moment. When you water it and take care of it daily, you can experience it forever. We've been wired towards an instant gratification, instant pleasure mindset. All of the adverts that we see, whether they're online or offline, are geared to driving us towards making instant decisions for instant promises of pleasure. The catch is, not only does that instant pleasure not satisfy us, the feeling doesn't last. We're so used to seeing all the strap lines and headlines on the internet. Learn this language in five minutes. Get the ideal body in 10 minutes a day. Become a millionaire in 12 months. Now all of these sound brilliant, right? The problem is, they're not real. They're not true. They're false promises. The reason why it works is because it appeals to one of the most basic human desires. Situational improvement without major resource investment. Of course you can pick up a few words in another language or shed a few pounds of weight if that was your goal. Or maybe you will make a little bit more money. But real knowledge, real awareness, real fitness, real business, all of these things take time. Real relationships, real connection, real purpose takes time. Naturally, the internet headlines focus on the short term instead of the long term. Because most of us would never click on something if it said, learn a language in five years with dedicated daily practice. We wouldn't click on something that said, here is the one hour workout that you need to do every single day. And we wouldn't click on the one that said, if you want to be a millionaire, here are the 10 failures that you will go through in year one, how broke you might be by year three, and you may not even make it by year nine. The important lesson here is, if you want meaning, if you want purpose, if you want fulfillment, those things take time. And I, I just sense energy intuitively too. Like I'll take a meeting with someone and decide in a, in a meeting whether I'm gonna speak to them again or not. And I just trust that because my intuitions, I've been trying to strengthen it over the years and it's, it rarely lets me down. So I kind of go with that a lot. And my, my encouragement to everyone listening is you have a powerful intuition, you're just covering it with your head. So just listen to how you feel when you're <laughs> with someone. Like listen to your heart, listen to your gut, listen to your instinct, because it's probably usually right. Don't let your head get in there and make stuff up. The thing is to get really close to that fear. So what we usually do embrace is it. embrace it, get close to it, get intimate with it. We become the bat. <laughs> Sit we, in the bat cave. Literally, yeah. And embrace the fear. Totally. Yeah. We run away from fear. We like to run away and go, oh, it's not coming with me. And Or what we do is we hear one thing and we define the whole understanding of our fear based on that one thing. Yes. So it's like someone, and I'll give you a normal example in a normal life scenario. Yes. Someone says to you in the office, you know that, you know that they're gonna cut a few people. Uh -huh. And you don't even check, you don't even Is know. It real? And Is now it? you just made it real and now you're running with it and you're trying to run away from it. So you're trying to avoid conversations with your boss. You're trying to avoid any conflict. You're trying to, you know, you're just, you're just, you're just trying to avoid it. And so actually what you need to do is go, okay, let me actually discover that fear. Let me go intimate with that fear. Let me ask myself, where's that fear coming from? What am I really scared of? What am I really scared of? Am I really scared of losing my job? Am I scared of not having any money? What am I really scared of? And when you get to the root, and I call it the why ladder in the book. Mm -hmm. So it's asking yeah. yourself, what am I scared of? And then go, why am I scared of this? Why am I scared of this? Why am I scared of this? And when you can't ask why any longer, You've got to the answer and that's what you have to deal with. Most of us are not dealing with what we're actually scared of. So that's how you let go. Yeah. You let go by keep asking yourself. So I'll give you an example of mine. Like if, if I heard that or if you hear that in your office that people are getting cut, it's like, 
you just get scared and panicked. But the question is, why am I scared of that? Am I scared of that because I haven't been working hard for six months? Am I scared of that because I've been skipping meetings? Am I scared of that because I know my boss will probably fire me first? Or am I scared because I've been performing really well and I'm expecting a promotion? Knowing which one it is, it sets you up to build the path forward. Yeah. Not knowing that just puts you in this panic frenzy. Anything that happens from an external item or something that's induced from something external never feels like you earned it. It never feels like you got there yourself. And hence you become a dependent person on that experience. Whereas when you've built something, it's your experience to go back to at any point. And the thing I love about that is there's, there's, this, awesome mo mo uh, there's this awesome part in this movie called Limitless where Robert De Niro is talking to Bradley Cooper and Bradley Cooper's taking a pill to be limitless. And Robert De Niro goes, he goes, you know what, you've, I know you've taken something, I know you, you think you're smarter than you are, but because you haven't worked for it, you don't know how to use it. And therefore you will fall down, therefore you will fail. And it's, it's such an interesting, and I feel the same way, that any experience that's coming from anything external, we will feel insecure when we don't have it. Whereas when you've meditated and you've really worked hard at building those experiences and that discipline and going deep, you know you can access that at any point in your life. And that's the beauty of, of doing it yourself, you know, to, to get there yourself. You talked about the fear of fear and how you had to learn to let go of your fear of fear. What does that actually mean, letting go of the fear of fear? Yeah, so I talk about how we fear the wrong things. Like, what do we fear? So most of us are fearful of how our friends are reacting, what's happening on social media, and what's the random bit of news that we heard. None of it is fact-based. That's one of the biggest issues it's that we have. It's worry-based. It's worry-based, and it's also imagination-based. So we become fiction writers. We've all watched too many movies. <laughs> now we start writing these beautiful movies in our head. We're not beautiful, scary movies yes. in our head of what may happen. So our imagination, and Seneca said it best, we suffer twice. One in reality and one in imagination. Mm. Right? We suffer twice. And this is the what biggest... What actually happens to us. Totally. And then the story we continue to tell totally. ourselves. Totally. Now there's this incredible study in the book that I have to talk about. So tell they me. took monks and they took non-monks and they... They set, competed against each they other. They competed <laughs> against each other, literally. So they put this plate where you experience heat. And so what happens is the non-monks touch this plate. Now this plate heats up gradually, softly, uh -huh. and then at one point it gets really hot for 10 seconds and then it cools down. And so what happened is that when the non-monks touched it, the anxiety and pressure and stress in their brain just triggered straight away, even though it wasn't that hot. It wasn't hot. It, it was heating, but it I wasn't gotcha. hot to do anything major to you. But the anxiety and stress in imagination or in anticipation went through the roof in the non-monks. Now this is what's fascinating. When the monks touched it, they showed that it didn't feel anything as it rose, but as it got to its highest, they felt physical pain, but they showed no trigger of emotional pain because they did not assign any emotional element to that pain. So my point with that is, you can look at the news right now and you can get scared straight away and get in complete freeze mode, feeling stuck, paralyzed, whatever it is, because what you're now doing is you're creating a story of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that story... And you can cause sickness in yourself. You can cause sickness inside yourself. Just by the story, yourself. not actually... The reality. The, the, the facts of the disease hitting you or something happening physically to you. Totally. And that story, again, can be used positively. So your story may actually be true. But if it's gonna right. be true, now you can prepare. And that shifts you away from being scared because now you're preparing. Yes. And so the real You can be answer, confident because you prepared. Exactly. And so we should be shifting our fear energy into preparation energy. Because what fear does is it keeps you locked there, mm. right? We just feel stuck. I'll give you an example. Like when you were preparing for big games, when you used yes. to play in the NFL, yes. right? And you're playing American football against some of the biggest athletes in the world. It's like, you can either sit there and be scared that you're gonna play this game on the weekend, uh -huh. or you can prepare. And yeah. your confidence is in the preparation. So when people go, how do I feel confident right now? Are you preparing? Are you putting the reps? Are you putting the reps? Yeah. Are you building your immunity? Mm -hmm. Are you taking your vitamins? Are you- Drinking lots of water. Are you drinking lots of water? Are you taking the steps that are needed to prepare for whatever's coming? You will feel more confident that way. Yeah. There are sometimes when I'm, with a social media person who says something really useful for my roots. And there's someone down when I'm with roots and they say something else. And there's a great story actually about when the prime minister of India, Modi, he visited Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg interviewed him at Facebook at the headquarters. And Mark Zuckerberg told a story. He said that 
when he was struggling with the direction of Facebook in 2009, he went up to his mentor to ask a question. Now, Mark Zuckerberg's mentor happened to be Steve Jobs. And so he went up to Steve Jobs and he said, Steve, I'm struggling with the direction of Facebook. What do I do? And at that time, you know, I mean, Steve Jobs is Steve Jobs. He could have said anything and mm -hmm. it would have made sense. But, you know, he could have said, go and meet a venture capitalist. He could have said, go and meet an investor. He could have said, go and meet a tech company. He could have said, I'll tell you what to do. Instead, he said, I think you need to go to India and spend some time in an ashram, a monastery in India with monks. He goes, when you do that, you'll find the answer of what you want to do. And to me, that is exactly why the people that are most successful in this world are successful, because they surround themselves with people who have differing beliefs. And MIT did a research study on this. They found that people who are more innovative and creative in an organization knew people who didn't know each other. So when you know people who all know each other, you end up with the same answer, the same belief and confirmation bias exists, mm -hmm. and you just keep building that echo chamber. Whereas if you've got two people who don't agree and you get a checking system, then you can trust your gut and go with what you believe. So I think I try and move away from having people around me. And it's not just yes men or yes women. It's about, it's not just about that. It's about building a circle of people, like you said, that want different things for you and knowing what they want for you. So when I'm with my mom, all my mom cares about is my health, <laughs> right? My mom does not care how successful I am, how many videos happen, how many people I help, even that. And my mom will get over that. She's like, how's your health? Like, are you taking care of yourself? Are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? Like, that's my mom. And it's like, if I go and I measure everything, most of that, that's wrong. But if I know that that's what my mom wants for me, that's beautiful. That's what I get from her. And she'll take care of that. And same, you know, everyone plays a different role in your life. Don't expect everyone to play the role you want and don't expect everyone to play the same role. Recognize that everyone's playing their role in your life and let them play it. That's what makes a good movie. If everyone played the same role in a movie, it'd be boring. Very boring. Yeah, right? So the two extremes that most of us experience are either I have to think I'm the best, yes. I'm the best in the world, I can, do I can crush anyone, <laughs> like I'm like gonna show everyone what I'm like, or most of us experience the other extreme, which is I'm the worst. Mm. I'm the stupidest, I'm the dumbest, I'm the most worthless, I'm the biggest loser. Notice how that's both ego. Mm, the really? E yes. Why is the negative so ego? So the ego wants to be the best of the best, or the ego wants to be the worst of the worst. The ego won't accept being in the middle. Really? The ego wants to feel the deepest sense of being the lowest. And that's why <laughs> victim mentality yes. is actually a, subsequence of ego. Really? Yeah, that's how it's explained in the Bhagavad Gita because the point is that you can't deal with just being bad, you have to be the, the worst. worst. My yeah. pain is yeah. the worst. I exactly. think um, Jada talked about this yes. on your podcast where she was like, you know, I had to tell people why my hurt was more painful than their hurt and they could never understand how bad it was. Right? Exactly, exactly. That's, that's ego it, Yeah, as that's well. ego as well. So you see these two sides of ego keeping us locked away and so the only way to get with that and the only way to balance it and bring it all into one is genuine self-honesty. Honesty is the best place to be. And the best thing about honesty is I'm really good at this, I'm really average at that, and I'm really bad at that. Mm. And the challenge we have with that is most of us have no idea. We just have zero self-awareness about what we are good at, what we are bad at, and what we're average at. So we think, I'm pretty average at everything. I'm pretty right. good at everything. And when I hear those answers, I'm like, simple things, just go and talk to people that know you. Yeah, what am I great at? Ask them, what's my superpower? Yeah. What do I do differently? What do you think I do that no is different does, that no yeah. one else does? And guess what? I guarantee you, if you ask a colleague, if you ask a friend, if you ask a family member, if you ask a people from- They'll say from, different things They'll too. say yeah. different things but you get to learn about yourself. So real confidence comes from knowing your strengths and going all in on them. Mm -hmm. Your confidence does not come from just standing up the right way or just saying the right stuff to yourself. Body like, language only. Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's important. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in all of that, but what I'm saying is that that doesn't build real confidence. Yeah. Real confidence comes from thinking, I'm really good at this, I know I can do this, and I love doing it, and, it, and really this is the most important bit, Confidence comes from serving other people. Mm -hmm. When you see the impact you have on others, and this is the biggest issue, the reason why we have such low self-esteem today in the world is because people are not serving others. So they don't see the profound impact they have on others. When you put out a video or a podcast and people tag you on Instagram and they say, Lewis, you stop me from depression mm -hmm. or you help me out of a divorce. Yeah. Or people, when they watch my content, they'll be like, that stopped me from committing suicide or whatever it is. When you see that, 
you get such a deep sense of self-worth that you matter. And guess what? Mm. Everyone matters. Whether you matter to one people or one million people, everyone matters. But if you see your impact on someone's life, you will feel such a deep sense of self-worth. And so whether you're serving at a, uh, giving out free food, or whether you're serving at a local charity place, or whether you're serving through your work, serve, 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 because when you take that step, you you get a boost of self-esteem. Every day we recharge our phones, but we forget to recharge ourselves. Let's just say we slept well the night before, which means we start our day with 100% charge. When we wake up in the morning, we roll over and 80% of us check our smartphones before we brush our teeth. We scroll through social media, we browse through emails. That takes away 10% of our energy. Let's say we now have 90% charge left. We then commute to work. We spend our day in the office, in meetings, interacting with colleagues, finishing off projects and assignments. We now have 40% charge left. On the way home, we commute through traffic or on the train, and that takes away another, let's say 10%. We now have 30% charge left. We come home and switch on Netflix, talk to someone about what our day was like, and sometimes we lose another 10%. We now have 20% charge left. At 20% on our phones, usually the charge bar goes red. We get an alert. We get a message that tells us that we only have 20% battery left. The question is, do we notice when our charge is at 20% or 10%? There are always signs from our bodies, our brains, our minds, but are we tuned in? One of the best things we can do to recharge is to exercise. The hardest part of any workout is actually the 15 minutes leading up to it. We come up with 15 reasons why we don't want to sweat and we change our mind 15 different times. CNN reports that when you work out, your brain creates more serotonin, which sends messages to your nervous system of happiness and well-being. Working out for 30 to 40 minutes every day can recharge our battery by 20%. Meditation is an incredible way to recharge our batteries. Exactly what the gym does for the body, meditation can do for the mind. Meditation gives us downtime physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Meditation also directly impacts your entire nervous system by reducing your body's productions of stress-related chemicals such as cortisol. Meditation is a great way to recharge and can take you back up 20%. We've all heard about incredible morning routines, but the one thing that can make a huge difference to your recharge is your evening routine. 35% of us are not getting the recommended seven hours of sleep per night. Remember, every body and mind is different. Make sure you find the amount of time you need to get that serious battery recharge. And the 75-year study by Harvard found that beyond anything, the real sense check for happiness and meaning in life was relationships, connections, interactions with depth that are fulfilling and full of joy. Making time for deep, meaningful interactions every day can give the recharge our battery seriously needs. What if we recharged ourselves as much as we recharge our phones? Because if we don't, we'll end up like one of our phones in the bottom of some drawer in our home. So there's a book that I love called The Journey Home. It's the story of a a man who hitchhiked at the age of 19 from America and London across the world in search for the truth. And it's incredible because it shows that desire is a true seeker and it's got travel, it's got potential romance opportunity, it's got that sacrifice, it's got everything. And it's just, it's a true story, it's an autobiography. It's just a really incredible story of how someone can truly seek the truth and want to find themselves and what that takes and what that looks like. So that book is incredible. It's called The Journey Home by Radhanath Swami. It's an autobiography. It's incredible. I highly recommend it. And then the Bhagavad Gita is the book I studied as a monk. It's 5,000 years old. It's the story of a warrior uh, getting advice from a divine coach, getting insight into life. It's 
been, it's, it's a book that's like the classic of India. And today, most knowledge that I read seems like it stems from it. Like there's rarely a quote or a Instagram quote or a Tumblr quote that I find that wasn't influenced by the Bhagavad Gita. It's, it's not the easiest read, but it's incredible if you dive into it with someone who knows it well. So we're actually creating bubbles of reality that are almost illusion-like, somewhat inception-like. We're almost creating a dream within a dream within a dream. And you get so lost in that definition of success that you forget a broader, higher perspective definition of success. Does that resonate? Does that make sense? That often what happens is that we're so in our closed groups, we don't open up to what's actually happening outside in the world. So I'm talking about these people with robotic arms and legs, bionic arms and legs, people who, Paralympians who are proving phenomenal things without even having limbs. Can you imagine that? It's, it's an amazing achievement. Definitely take a look at it. And it makes us immediately feel more grateful for what we have. Here's the shocking truth about loneliness. This is why we need to take it more seriously. Surveys show one out of three adults are lonely and the health impacts of loneliness are shocking. Studies have shown that people who are lonely are 50% more likely to die before their time. Researchers show that loneliness is as damaging to our health as not smoking one, not two, but 15 cigarettes per day. Only around half of Americans say they have meaningful face-to-face -face interactions with a loved one, family or friend every single day. Members of Generation Z say they are the loneliest generation and experience more health problems as a result of it. Loneliness was also linked with less physical activity, compulsive use of digital technology and not being able to share our problems with others. In a study of 20,000 adults, 54% say that they don't know one person that knows them well. Additionally, 56% of people said that the people they surround themselves with are not necessarily with them. And approximately 40% said that they lack companionship, don't have meaningful relationships, and feel isolated. All of us have been in the crowd but felt lonely. All of us have been invited to a party, but wanted to leave. All of us have likes on social media, but don't feel loved in real life. So many of us can get comments on our posts, but can't get a friend to call us back. Loneliness is real, so here's what we have to do. After studying over 2,500 consumers over six years, research found that people that see material possessions as a sign of success felt more lonely. Investing our money in experience rather than things is a great way of breaking the loneliness and materialism cycle. Schedule a time each day to talk to a friend. Take a class to learn something new. Volunteer to deepen your sense of purpose. Spend time with people who look more like your future than your past. The mental health charity Mind cites two factors that can cause loneliness someone either not having enough social contact or, more interestingly, being surrounded by people but not feeling understood, loved or cared for. Notice, it's not just being around people but being understood. It's not just being invited and present but feeling like you're contributing. Loneliness really comes then from a lack of significance or lack of worth and what you bring to the table and what value you truly offer. Lonely is not being alone. It's the feeling that no one loves you. So start by loving yourself. Start with compassion, right? Just start with compassion. One of the worst things we can do to ourselves is judge ourselves. When we use critical judgment on ourselves, when we start looking down on ourselves, when we feel that we're bad people for feeling this way, we're only pushing away our inner voice and making it feel more quiet. We do that to ourselves all the time. When you judge yourself and you think, oh, I'm such a bad person for feeling like this, immediately you're stopping yourself from growth. Whenever you feel any thought in the mind, remember envy, jealousy, greed, anger. These aren't you, right? They are all 
figments, they are all aspects, they're all facets or behaviors of our mind. You're separate from your mind, right? Just as we're separate from these bodies, you're separate from your mind, your pure consciousness, right? You, you, you like knowledge, you like wisdom, you like having other people achieve stuff, you like seeing success because we have that purity that's in there. But our mind is kind of like a shadow that overcasts all of that and then we start believing we're our mind. When we start believing we're our mind, we start believing that we're bad, that we're greedy, that we're envious. The truth is we aren't. We aren't egotistic. We've just let that shadow become such a big part of our reality that we've adopted that as our personality. We've adopted that to how we feel. So how does someone find purpose in chaos? when yeah. they can't even get out of the thinking because they're just trying to survive? Yeah, so uh, beautiful question. My, my biggest answer is, first of all, I empathize with anyone who's been in that situation having, I can't ever say I've been in that situation yes. in the same way, but I've experienced similar things. You've seen feeling in your life. Yes. Yeah, in my own way. And I've seen my mom go through stuff yes. like that. I, I know that my mom worked really hard to raise me and my sister while working, yes. you know, while running around. And I've, I've seen my mom be that incredible powerhouse of a person. And the, the main thing I would say is, what you can do right now is find meaning in what you do. Make what you do meaningful. Your pa meaningful, passionate, and purposeful. You don't need to suddenly look to become an entrepreneur or start a side hustle or find some more time. Find meaning, and the way you find meaning is you genuinely stop, press pause for a second, and go, what am I living for? Like, what am I living for right now? And if you're living for your child, and if you're living mm -hmm. to provide and put food on the table, that is a beautiful thing that we should celebrate more. Yeah. And sometimes it takes us a moment to stop and celebrate that. And so I would say find meaning, because you can't always find happiness, you can't always find positivity, but you can always find meaning mm. in that position. So I'll give an example, like, I lost someone really important to me, a mentor, yes, a few us. days back. Mm -hmm. I can't be positive about that. You can't be happy You're about sad. that. Yeah, it's yeah. hurtful. You feel sad, you, you feel lost, but guess what, I can find meaning in it. Mm. Because I can make a list of every lesson he taught me mm. and make a plan to try and live every one of those lessons. Wow, that's right? beautiful. And, and so if you're in a really tough situation right now, don't look for positivity. Don't look for happiness. Look for meaning. The word Dharma means a lot of things and it's always hard to translate ancient Sanskrit words <laughs> into modern day English. But the closest two definitions are your true nature and your eternal purpose. So it's almost like this is something that's already existing. It's already almost part of your DNA and part of your makeup, and it's allowing that to be completely unleashed. But I break it down in the book to make it really simple because just like you, the amount of people that say to me, Jay, what's my passion? What's my purpose? So I use Dharma to be described as the word purpose, and then I create this formula or this mathematical equation for how to unlock purpose. And to make it simple, and obviously people can dive into the book and do the questions and everything else that's in there, it's passion plus strength plus compassion equals purpose. And I'm gonna say that again because I love to break it down because I'm gonna break each of these down for you as well, that passion plus strength plus compassion equals purpose or dharma. And this is also similar with the concept of ikigai in the Japanese terminology, which is reason for being. So you find these in a lot of ancient traditions, but now let's focus on the word passion. How do you know what your passion is? So to break it down, I've been thinking that purpose is like an adult, passion is like a teenager, interest is like a child, and curiosity is the womb. So the birthplace of passion is actually curiosity and interest. Mm. And I think we waste so much time trying to be like, what am I really passionate about? What do I really believe in? That's gonna take years to figure out. And I've heard you say this too, that's going to take experimenting, it's going to take testing. But the thing you can start with right now is the simplest form of what am I curious about? What am I interested in? Let me take a course on that, or let me take a seminar on that, or let me go and try that, or let me shadow someone who's done that. And that experimenting process is the only way to unlock your passion. 
The monkey mind is what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. The monkey mind is restless. The monkey mind is jumping from branch to branch. The monkey mind's trying to find a bigger banana. The monkey mind is constantly just like feeling flustered, dissatisfied, scarce, scarce and overthinking everything. The monk mind is the exact opposite. The monk mind is calm and composed. The monk mind knows to be focused and aware. The monk mind knows, so everything in this book and everything that we're talking about is the transformation from the monkey mind that we experience to the monk mind. The monkey mind is almost the enemy to the monk mind. It's the opposite. Yes. I read an incredible study that changed the way I create and think. And it said that the human mind can't be logical and creative at the same time. How many of you have ever walked from a highly creative brainstorm where you were fueled with passion and then had to talk about numbers and business and, right? It's tough, right? Anyone ever found that quite difficult? It's quite challenging and the mind's like trying to run from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain. So what I do is I create in depth. So I go really deep into my creation and then I go really deep into everything else that I have to do. So before I went to India, I created my content in advance. And so when I was in India, I was able to really switch off. So the beauty of being able to be in India for 21 or 30 days, or wherever I am in the world for that matter, I'm then not having to think of creativity as stress or pressure. I'm able to do creativity as a form of passion and service. And so when I was in India, I was able to not look at Instagram. I was able to not look at Facebook. I was able to completely switch off for 21 days when I was there earlier in January. And I started my year in the way I wanted to. So I was meditating for eight hours a day. I was spending time with my teachers who are mind-blowing and incredible and trying to learn from them and take in knowledge and wisdom from them and continuously praying to be of more service this year and make a difference this year. So that's how I chose to spend my January. And I had so many people saying to me, they were just like, Jay, it's January. Things are going well in your career. How can you take 21 days off? Right, that pressure, that noise. I was like, things are going good for you. How can you take time off? I was like, things are going good because I'm doing this. Right, like, you know, I had one of my teachers that has kept saying to me for years, he goes, if you want to move three steps forward, you have to go three steps deep. And so if I'm not going forward, I know it's because I haven't gone deep. So for me, that's a big priority for me, and that's what I try and do, and I'm, not, I try and do that every day, but I also believe in immersive experiences. So a lot of us today, we live in this world which is like 10 minutes a day. Do it for 10 minutes a day, everything will be great. And that is great, there's nothing wrong with that. But imagine you spent with a boy or a girl, your partner, whoever it was, someone that you just started dating. Imagine you spent 10 minutes a day with them. How long would it take you to figure out whether you wanted to fall in love with them or not? <laughs> Probably a long time. And so when you go immersive, if you spend a weekend away with someone, you know whether you like them or not. And meditation, mindfulness, all these habits are the same. The more you immerse yourself, the more you get an experience that stays with you, the more that you can live with that experience and keep going back to it for 10 minutes a day. So I really believe in immersive experiences. I love the 10 minute a day advice, but I also deeply believe in having a deep, immersive, absorbed experience that completely takes over your whole body, mind, and soul. We're wired for generosity, but we're educated for greed. I think I just Gosh, said it to you two years ago so when I was good, on the podcast. Yes. And it's like, and, and when I said that, and the that's statement, so it was, a, yeah, and it's so true, we're wired for generosity, oh but gosh. we're educated for greed, because what happens is, when we're kids, you see kids you share. share. Go out their you way, want they wanna share. It's yeah. part of my candy bar, whatever, totally. right? Yeah. yeah, and then as we get older, we're told that there's less, and this is what the key is. As we get older, we're told there are finite numbers of how many kids get made on the basketball or baseball team. Yes. We're told there's we're a limited. finite number of college spaces. We're told there's a finite number of how many tickets there are. We're told there's a finite number of people that are successful, guess what? In the theater of happiness, there are infinite and unlimited seats. And there is a seat <laughs> with your name on it. That's okay. There is a seat with your name on it in the theater of dreams, wow. in the theater of happiness. But you think that because you think that there are only 100 people allowed in, that if someone else makes it before you, that you don't get in. And guess what? Is there a cap on how many billionaires there are in the world? No. No. Is there a cap on how many millionaires there are in the world? No. no. Is there a cap on how many happy people there are in the world? No. no. And that's why I really am encouraging Forbes. I want Forbes, forget printing a rich list, happiness print a happy list, list. Wow. print a service list, print wow. a list of who is we should serving. Do that. We should do who that. Who's serving the most in the world? Wow. Right? That'll, be, that'll be competition Talk, based. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> I gave more than you yeah, gave. And that's why it should be service based on time, energy, and money.
Uh -huh. Because we should start showing how much time people give, mm -hmm. how much energy people give. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa, I don't think she gave any money to her charities. Right. But she gave a lot of time and energy. Yeah. You know, you look at all the people who made a change in the world, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, like they may not have given a lot of money to stuff. Yeah. They you, gave time and energy. You don't have to give resources, but your resourcefulness, your love, your time, love that. your focus, your attention, your compassion. Love that. Uh, you know, yeah. resourcefulness of the of the heart, not of the wallet, I think is love key. that. And you don't need to have a lot of money to make a big impact. You don't. Yeah. There's, and, and this is the training. See, we've been educated for greed because we've been told everything's limited. There's limited number of this, limited number of this. Number. And every time you play in numbers, and I think it was Bob Marley who said it, but every time you play in numbers, you'll always be dissatisfied because uh, guess what? Someone's gonna always have more. Someone's always gonna have more. I was speaking to a friend recently, and, and, it's, and, and this friend was telling me that he uh, you know, bought a home, which is very expensive. Yes. Uh, very, very expensive. And he went to a party at someone else's house. And he told me that when he was getting a tour of this party, he found out that this person had a painting on his wall, which cost the amount his house cost. Shut up. <laughs> and so he was joking when wow. he was like, that, that guy's painting, painting in the he's, house. He's got my house on his wall. Wow. <laughs> and, and that just puts things into perspective. And you think about that, like, and then you look at someone like Jeff Bezos and you think, oh, well, he's the richest man in the world, but does he have the most fame? No, he doesn't. Right. Does he have the most beauty? Uh, subjective dis right. decision. Does he have the most strength or power? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. And so no one has the most of everything. So when you measure yourself by numbers, you'll always be second, third, fourth, fifth in something. For me, breathwork's really important because I really feel that we experience one of two things. We're either experiencing our mind ahead of our body. So everyone's had that experience where their mind's racing and the body's like, oh, I'm just tired, put me back in bed. Or we experience the other extreme, which is the mind's feeling really tired and the body's having to rush around. So the mind's like, oh, give me a break. But the body's like, no, but I need to do this and this. And so for me, breath work really realigns my mind and my body in the morning and brings it back together. Because when I wake up, I can be really creative sometimes, but oh my God, I've got a million ideas of videos I wanna make. And I'm like, no, look, just calm down. The body's not ready yet. You know, or you wake up and if you do, which I've, I really avoid now, but if you do look at your phone first thing, got all these messages coming in, your mind has to go from zero to 100 miles per hour in two seconds, literally like the fastest car in the world. And the body's just like, oh, look, just give me a break. I just woke up. And so for me, the personal and breath work just allows me to align my body and mind. So that's why I do it. I want to know how close to encapsulating the notion of thinking like a monk can you get? Like how, like if you were to give somebody just a nutshell notion of what that means, what would you say? I'd say it means to live a life in alignment. And what that means is that you live a life where what you think, what you say, and what you do are aligned with your truest self. And what I mean by your truest self is the self that was not given to you by your parents or by your education or by media or movies or not the self that you've created to function in the world. So I think if you strip away all of those expectations, obligations and opinions, what you're left with, if you live in alignment with that, then you're thinking like a monk. I take out 21 to 30 days every year to go and live back with the monks where I used to live in India. So I lived as a monk for three years. And every day I've made it a priority to continue my meditation practice, which is currently two hours a day. It's been that way for the last 13 years. It's been the bedrock and foundation of my life. So to that very big question that Vishen asked me, my first piece of advice would be finding your daily rituals, finding your daily habits, finding your practices that act as the foundation because we're living in such busy, hectic, crazy times. How many of you know that you have a schedule and still half of the things don't happen on that schedule? <laughs> Right? Anyone ever been in that position? Or how many of you go through that process where you start watching something really educational on YouTube and then two videos later you're watching something about Justin Bieber's mom, right? And it's like, <laughs> and, then, and then you're like, how did I, how did I get there? Like, how did, how did that happen? And, and you end up getting lost in this world. And so whether it's in a small way of getting lost through the content you know, rabbit hole or whether it's getting lost by getting distracted from what's really meaningful to you, for me, Refining my intentions on a daily basis is one of my favorite, favorite habits. I am a, such a huge fan of visualization. Oh, go on, tell us. I like that as well because yeah. it's vivid. Go on. Uh, the first time I started hearing about visualization was when I realized that 
David Beckham visualized free kicks when he before he took them. Uh, Lewis Hamilton visualized the racetrack before he races. He visualizes it. Does he, he visualizes Beckham? himself driving the car on that racetrack because he knows what the track looks like. Obviously, so he's visualizing how he's taking that bend how he's taking each part of the car, et cetera. And same with Beckham taking free kicks. And when I started looking, when I started thinking about it, I thought, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And that was the first time I'd, I'd come across it. And it, for me, it wasn't visualization as a meditation then. I just thought, this is cool. Mm. You know, here are some cool people doing it. And then I started to do it before I go on stage when I'm speaking at an event. I'll visualize myself walking onto stage. I'll visualize myself saying the first thing. So whenever I'm doing something that's pressureful or anything that I feel I feel stressed towards, I visualize myself doing it the way I want to first, which almost reduces the experience when you actually go out there because you've lived that life once. The next time you walk out there, you've taken away the stress and the anxiety. Even if it wasn't a performance thing or a high level thing such as Lewis Hamilton, would you recommend it? Say you have to have a conversation with someone totally if you've got to have a conversation with someone that's really challenging observe and visualize a yourself saying what you need to say visualize yourself in their seat listening to you and then visualize yourself as an observer too the first thing i want you to believe is whenever you feel an emotion that you don't like about yourself whether it's greed anger envy ego whatever it may be First thing I want you to recognize is that it's like having a bad friend in your room that's really close to you. It's a friend who's going through some troubles, right? That's what it is. It's not you. It's like having someone else in the room who's having those experiences. And with that person, one of the things you want to do is start with compassion. If your friend was envious of someone else, you'd feel compassionate for them. You'd feel bad for them. You want to help them, right? Empathetic, not just sympathetic, but empathetic. Empathy and compassion is actionable, right? It's not just feeling bad for someone, it's actionable, it's wanting to do something. Negative self-judgment is the worst thing you can do. I do feel that it's my responsibility to get my intentions right. And so one of my biggest visualizations that I do do in the morning is I, so I believe that good intentions in our life are seeds and bad intentions are weeds. And so what it's I seeds and weeds system seeds and weeds good, and every good. single day what I- why he's getting the followers. <laughs> it's gonna get the likes with the seeds and weeds. <laughs> Every that's, that's very Snoop. It's very Snoop. Yeah, it? yeah. So okay. different, different yeah. seeds and yeah, different yeah. weight. Different seeds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I like that. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Go on. Yeah. Uh, no, so I was saying. So what I do is I reflect on my intentions visually every day, and I think about how many deals am I taking just because they make me money or how many videos am I making just because they get me views or how much stuff am I doing just for the vanity or just for the fame or success or what I think is is going to be good for me, like financially, economically, like how the, how the default mind is set up to think about security as opposed to love and compassion and wanting to change the world and wanting to make a different place. And I'm constantly battling with the two. So what I would do every day is I'll reflect on my intentions, I'll reflect on the deals I've just signed, I'll reflect on... Uh, things I'm being offered and I'll literally look at each offer deal whatever it is each item of thought and I'll say is that a seed or a weed and if it's a weed I'll pluck it out I'll literally visualize myself plucking it out of the the garden of my mind and pulling it out and taking it out and if it's a seed then I'll water it and I'll say okay I want that to grow because I am doing that for the right intention when you can be trusted with the small things and the small moments you get trusted with more and more and more and so like it helps to just in that moment, and it's in those painful moments that you realize how powerful you are. We all know that, like you really yes. recognize it. And, and what you said was beautiful about not rushing through the pain because, and, and you know, I, I, this example has probably been shared before, but if you have a wound and you've cut yourself, it's like you can't rush the healing. You can't rush it. If you broke your arm, I mean, and you've been through so many bodily yes. injuries, you can't rush the process. It's going to take six weeks minimum to heal a broken bone. Yeah, Correct. minimum. And you've got to sit through that. It's painful. You, there's no it injections you can take. There's no videos you can watch. There's nothing you can listen to. But our challenge is we try and rush through the pain yeah. rather than reflect through the pain. We try to rush the healing process Try to too. rush the healing and you can't rush healing. And healing is meant to be slow because it buys you time. It buys you reflection. It gives you so much space. To slow down. To slow down. And that's what your body's calling out for. And this is our emergency. Like, how many times have you heard it where you slow down, you slow down, and that's when you fall ill? Because guess what? Your body has been trying to tell you to slow, slow down. down yeah. When you feel pain, so I, I write about it and think like a monk, pain makes you pay attention. Yeah. That's what pain's for. 
Pain's Notice not. Notice this. Notice this. Look Notice at me. Notice me. Look yeah. at me. It's, cra- it's like a crying baby craving yeah. for attention. When a baby's crying, you don't just go, ah, oh, it's crying. <laughs> you don't just go, oh, yeah, we'll just put it in another room and forget about it, right? <laughs> like you go to it and you find its needs. Whereas with our pain, when something's painful, we're just like, oh, yeah, I'll just forget about it. I'll escape from it. I'll do something else. Yeah. You have to go into I'll that pain. It. I'll numb the pain. I'll numb the pain. With That's alcohol it. Alcohol or whatever. Yeah. Hundred percent. That's that's usually our responses. What can I do to numb this? Work more, have sex more, drink more, whatever, drugs more, whatever it is. Rather than let me actually become alert. And guess what? The pain just gets higher and mm-hmm. higher and higher and higher because unfortunately, until it really hurts, we don't stop. And, or you need more and more to numb it with. So true. A lot of people find their passion through pain. They find it through pain that they went through, pain of someone that they loved and lost pain of someone who went through a physical ailment in their life or something that they went through, and then that becomes their passion, that they've seen the worst horrific type of pain and they never want to see it again, and that becomes what illuminates their passion to them. Mm. And so compassion is another way, and actually sometimes a simpler way, because we all know what pain we don't want to feel again, and we all know what pain we don't want someone else to feel again. How many of you spend a lot of your days multitasking? Okay, good. So a lot of us spend our time multitasking. Now studies show that only 2% of us are actually able to multitask. And when most people hear that, they're like, yeah, I'm in that 2%. (laughs) That's me, right? I'm in that 2%. Uh, You're probably not, I'm not, because it's only 2% of the global population of the world. Multitasking is a myth. And I find that as spiritual activists, as conscious change makers, as change agents of the world, whatever you want to call yourself, all of us, one of the biggest mistakes we've seen, and this was the quote that I shared and a thought from Martin Luther King that I've really held close to me, is he said, those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, Mm -hmm. right? Those who love peace need to learn to organize themselves as well as those who love war, i.e. people who are trying to build destruction in the world and distractions in the world are highly organized, highly focused, highly data oriented, highly strategic, highly process driven. And so we have to be the same. And when you spend time with Vision or you spend time with the Mind Valley team, you realize their success is intuitive, it is deep, it is full of love, but it is also highly strategic, it is also highly focused, and therefore it's effective. And so for me, my plea to all of you and to myself is whatever we're gonna do, let's get really strategic about it. Let's bring sincerity and strategy together. Let's bring data and dynamism together. Let's bring intuition and insight together. Right, let's not, let's not look beyond that and think, oh, that stuff's gonna work out because I inten- my intention's nice. Right, your intention's not gonna run a mile, but it will help you run the marathon but it's not gonna run that mile that you need to do right now. And so for me, intention and action, intention and attention, both of them are required. And so my recommendation is whatever your dream is, whatever you're inspired by, whatever you think is gonna have a positive impact on the world, bring both to that, right? Don't settle for one or the other. I usually write down each option that I have in life, and I think we all have different options in life, and then I'll place a word above it that feels like the right emotion. So either it can be fame, I could be doing something just because of ego and fame, I could be doing something out of love, I could be doing something for money and stability, I could be doing something for, uh, for inspiration and passion. So I try and define why it's defining that why, that intention mm. behind it. Like why would I take that extra flight off to mm. Singapore Oh, because I'm going to make X amount of money, right? Like, and, and, and literally, when you look at your life weed. like that, yeah, or like, yeah, there you go. And, and then I'd be like, okay, that's a weed. Now, can I transform it into a seed? Is there a way for me to make it more intentional, purposeful, and conscious? If I can, that's amazing. I'll do that. But if I can't, I, I need to stop taking things like that into my life. And now I understand for anyone listening, there are times in our life where money has to be the motivator because we need security, we need stability. But when you do it intentionally, at least then you don't expect that thing to bring you the greatest happiness because you know what purpose it's serving in your life. So I know a lot of people who'd love to quit their jobs and live their passion, but I'm like, no, but you know why, if you know why you're doing the job you're doing, you won't expect it to make Mm, you happy. You'll mm, know what it serves, right? What role it serves in your life. 
in um, shamanism, we have this viewpoint that spirituality is not separate from life. It's, it, it means that someone who's spiritual, even if they don't meditate or work with crystals or do any of these things, it means they're willing to evolve. I want to know what your thought is about that. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's beautiful and completely aligns with me. I don't think, see, we look at everything about, oh, what can I learn? And actually half of learning, in my opinion, is really unlearning. Everyone already has the answer inside of them. You're not really learning anything new, you're just trying to get rid of all the bad lessons you learned. And everyone has that, so it's not so much about like, oh, is this person going from here to here? It's not really that, it's like, is someone going from here to here? And for me, one of the ways I've always thought about it is you can't take the world further than where you visited internally. So for me, every person that we're meeting already has that journey right there and all you're asking them to do is look inwards as opposed to outwards. So no, I, I completely agree with you and I think that's a beautiful point that you've shared. And I think it's something nice for us to know so that we don't judge and label people. We don't walk around and think, oh, those are spiritual people, those are not spiritual people. Because, yeah, we're all. Yeah. We're all spiritual people. Yeah. And it's just that some are covered. It's like the sun's always out, but often it's covered with the clouds. Rarely here, a bit more lately. But some, it's, the sun is always out. It's just get covered by the clouds, and that's us. We've just been covered. And we get covered by those clouds, and they cloud our identity, they cloud our perception. And so all we're doing for ourselves and others is clearing out the clouds. And the more we do that for ourselves, the more we can do it for others, and the more we do it for others, the more we do it for ourselves. In 2016, I moved out to New York. So just let me paint a picture of 2016. I moved three jobs, I got married, Wow. I moved country and I just, just started a whole new life. Like my life just transformed. So we went through all of that with my wife yes. in one year. And by the way, all of that was surprises. The job change was surprises. Yeah. The country change was a surprise. The marriage was not a surprise. We planned right, right, that. Right, right, right. But apart from everything else, everything was a surprise. Now I said I like surprises so I can <laughs> roll with it. But my point is that's a lot of transition in a so year. So much transition. And I felt the burden of being in a new city where we had no family, we had no friends. And my wife, who loves being around her family and no one understands just how close she is to them, I felt this burden on me that I had taken away her time with her mm. family and now she was alone. So I was going out to work and she'd be crying at home. Mm. And I was thinking, she's got no friends, she's got no support. And I know you can relate to this yes, with moving and relationships lot, and so much going on. And so it's like, I'm dealing with that and guess what, six months later, I have to leave and move on and work on a new career to build everything myself and then I'm four months away from being broke. And so on top of all of this, I've now got four months away from being broke. I've got enough money, money saved for four months to pay for rent and groceries and in that's it. In New York it. City. In New yeah. York City and that's <laughs> it. And guess what, even on top of that, I've got 30 days before my visa runs out and I'm kicked out of the country. So I can't even live here anymore. So not only have I just got married, moved job three times, changed career again, had to move into apartment, no four months of being broke, and I might get kicked out in 30 days, and my renewal for my visa cost $15,000. Oh. So that's gonna eat into those four months. I have probably never been under that much emotional, yeah. physical, and, and mental pressure in my life. Like genuinely, I felt it. And I felt my body change. My, my breath was more stressed. I would be breathing faster. Shorter, shorter breaths, not deep breaths. Heart beating not faster, out. not working out. You get into lazy habits, you start craving junk food. Sugar to get energy. I'm yeah. living in a 500 square foot apartment with my wife, which is, which is tiny, like everything's in that space. And guess what, we both work from home. So I'm now sitting at a desk, hunched over, trying to figure stuff out. She's trying to cook in the same room. Like I'm trying to, just, just trying to figure out what to do. And I remember the next morning, sending like 100 emails to people and just being like, this is who I am, this is what I can do, how can we serve? And that was the same year that I ended up meeting you later yeah. in that year. Mm -hmm. And the beginning three months of that journey was so stressful. Like they were so stressful because I was like, what if I have to move back to London? What am I gonna say to her parents? I mean, I just took their daughter away. Like, uh, <laughs> just I've, got married, I've yeah. lived in New York City for six months and my life's falling apart. Like, you know, so much. And I've got all these views, but there's nothing, there's nothing mm -hmm. happening in. We met. You also, you also, I mean, at this time, you're also, growing so much. How are you able to create and reach this impact with your videos as yeah. that's growing 
while you're under so much stress and uncertainty. And I stopped a bit at that time. Like things slowed down hard. Like things slowed down. I remember that. I, I wasn't creating as much as I was because I don't enjoy creating from stress or pressure. And I don't think you can really create something from stress and pressure. So we really slowed down at that time. And when I was creating, I was creating from a place of recognizing that I could share what I had learned and what I had grown in so far. So anything I was sharing was like, this is what I've learned so far. So that was the biggest pain that I've been through in the last seven years, for sure. And all I can say is that I remember coming home to my wife knowing that this was gonna be the truth. And I came home and I said to her, I said to her, I guarantee you, this is gonna be the best thing that ever happened to us. What, the pain? The pain. I said that to her the night I came home and then she gave out for that. I literally came home, I looked her in the eyes and go, this is the scenario. And I just want you to know that I guarantee to you this is the best thing that's ever gonna happen to us. And I said to her, and this is, this is a monk statement that we used to repeat, I said to her, I'm just not gonna judge the moment. Don't judge the moment, because what we do is we try to label moments as good or bad. And when you label a moment as bad, it now does not have the opportunity to become good. I'll give an example, if I go, I don't like this book, this book's bad, right? And I don't, and I love this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if I say that, sure. guess what? I will never pick it up and recognize the value that's mm. inside of it because you've labeled it. Yes. And we label stuff, like we label, oh, that restaurant's bad. Mm. But when you label a that moment, person's bad, that now. person's bad, now mm. you can't learn from that person. Oh, a great one, that's a really good one. Mm. As soon as you start labeling people or anything as good or bad, you limit it. You stop it from being something else. And here's the truth, every moment can evolve into being anything if you give it the opportunity to. Right. But as soon as you say it's got no value anymore, you lose it. And so for me, I had to say to myself, don't judge the moment. And I'd keep repeating that don't to myself. Don't judge where you're at. Don't judge What's this. happening. Yeah, don't judge it as negative. Don't, don't just start saying it's negative. Because guess what, we've all been in positions where a gift turned into a curse and a curse turned into a That's gift. That's true. Right? We've also where our been dreams came true and it ended up not being what we wanted. Exactly. And it fell apart and it led us into the, our dreams. Totally. Why is it that so many people that win the lottery yeah. go broke? Yeah. Gifts can turn into curses That's too. True. But because we label them as the best moment in our life or the worst moment in our life. Whereas when you approach things to neutrality and just what you have on the table, you can be like, okay, what am I going to do next? The way to live your life in such a way that there's no cause for envy is that you've completely trained your mind to be under control of your intelligence and pure consciousness. You're actually able to guide it. Now, that will never be a 100% foolproof plan, right? It will fall apart. And that's where the only way to do it is to be able to substitute or train the thoughts of the mind every time it goes off to feel envious. Hence, start with compassion, then lead with gratitude. When you become grateful for what you have, you won't become envious for other people's. I would put this quote out on social media for this session that envy is the art of counting others' blessings and not your own. So when we're in that habit of gratitude, of counting our blessings, of focusing on what's really working for us, that is where we need to start. How have you related to deep spiritual learnings and at the same time being happy and content in the material world without going crazy? <laughs> Interesting question. I think that's the point of spiritual training. So it's like when we're, when we're immature in our spiritual learning, we're just starting out. When you first learn the first, everyone remember the first time they learned something? And they're like, I'm never talking to my family ever again, right? It's like, because you, you learn a little bit and you go, oh my God, I've been doing it all wrong. And now I can't talk to that person, I can't ever go to that event again. And you start making all these big decisions based on something small that you've learned. And so I think in the beginning of our lives, because to protect ourselves, which is a very normal desire and very good and very human, we think, okay, I need to take care of this, so now I'm going to shut out from all of this. But as we grow, we realize we can give more back. And so one of the ways I've always thought about it is, if you look at the ocean and you see someone drowning, you want to help them. But if you go in too soon and you're not strong enough, it's likely that you're going to get pulled in. And at that point, it's easier to shout out to a lifeguard who can come along, who's trained, who's disciplined, who's committed, who can go and make a difference. And so for me in my life, I'm always looking at if I can't bring someone up, I'm not going to spend time with them if they're going to pull me down. And it's drawing that line for me. 
So if I've been ever scared about my spirituality, rather than putting them down and going, oh, I'm not spending time with them because I'm putting them down, if I can't lift them up, then I'm going to protect myself by not being dragged down. But if I can pull them up, if I can lift them up, then that's when I'm able to go into that space and make an impact and make a difference. And that line has really helped me not go crazy because now I'm not doing it based on a judgment of them. I'm reflecting on my own abilities and flaws and, and the difference I can make. And I'm taking a, taking a stance. It's like someone asked me the other day, what is a complaint? And we were talking about litter. A complaint is you see a piece of trash on the floor and you go, oh, LA is so dirty. You've removed the agency that you can have an impact on that. A statement is, oh, LA's a bit dirty, there's trash on the floor, I'm gonna pick that up and throw it away, right? Taking that responsibility. So when we're irresponsible in our spiritual lives, we judge everyone and judge everything, and we mature, we start looking at it through compassion, empathy, and connection, and recognize we were just there a few years ago. And that's the biggest anchor in my life, is recognizing that I was addicted to, and still am in different ways, things that I don't believe are good for me spiritually, and I was, that, I was that guy, I was that kid, you know? And it's taken a journey, and someone had to believe in me, someone had to invest in me, someone had to reach their hand without being forced in and pull me out. And so that allows me to continue to operate in the world. I hope that answers your question. Anytime you have a negative thought, that's the mind. Right? Anytime you have a negative thought, you have a thought that's taking you away from a higher principle of collaboration, connection, humanity. Anytime you have a thought of harming someone else, anytime you have a thought of revenge, making someone else look bad, any of those things, you know it's that inner voice that tells you it, right? That's how you know the difference. Really, when you walk a thousand miles in someone else's shoes, you realize that you don't envy them, right? Robin Roberts, she had this great quote. She said that if we all chucked our problems into the middle of a room or whatever it is, we'd all grab ours back, right? When you really look at the struggle and challenges that people have been through, it doesn't seem so attractive. So how can we find a solution to being envied? Really always be humble, always be grounded. If there's people that are envying you, always express yourself in the most servant leader format, right? Don't ever let them, don't ever let it feel like reality. Be yourself, be humble, be grounded in that way. What's been the biggest lesson in the last 12 months for you? Because you've learned, you've created so much in the last 12 months, you've done so many things. What's been the biggest lesson for you in your life? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> I think I'd have to say that it's a, and I was saying it to a friend on the phone this morning when I was on the way to you, mm -hmm. and I was, just, I was just sharing it with him because he was having a moment in recognizing this. There's a wonderful verse in the Manu Smriti, which I talk about in Think Like a Monk, it's a monk book, and in the verse it says, when you protect your purpose, your purpose protects you. Now, I wanna, I wanna unpack that. What I mean by that is, your purpose is like a rare jewel and a rare gemstone. And imagine you were walking around with the most expensive diamond or jewel in the world. How would you protect it? You want to just like you just wave it out, yeah. Yeah, you want to just wear it on your chest. It's like this. Like a baby. Holding it. Yeah. Putting a pillow around it, a blanket. <laughs> You'd be like, yeah, protect it. You'd protect it. And so your purpose is like that. And guess what? Wow. People are going to tell you every day that that jewel is not worth anything. They're gonna tell you that that jewel is actually valueless. It doesn't have any impact on your life. They're gonna try and take away that value. They're gonna tell you that there's another jewel out there that you need to have more value. And what ends up happening is you don't, I love the word, look at the wording, protect your purpose. You have to protect it. So what happens is your success grows, you get more opportunities, mm. more ideas, more things coming your way. Temptations. But they can all take you away from your Distractions, purpose. Yeah. Distractions, And to me, I'm repeating this for myself because I'm like, I just wanna stick to what I was born to do and I'm so grateful that I get to do it, and I'm so happy I get to do it, and I wanna keep protecting it. I don't wanna get lost in the waves. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't wanna just get chucked in the waves of the ocean and just get lost and just yeah. not know where you're going. So yeah. for me, when you protect your purpose, your purpose protects you. Sometimes it's just what you're fascinated with right now. That's right. Because I think sometimes we make it too big and we're like, oh, well, what's my big purpose or what's my big service to the world? And it's like, well, well what moves you right now? Like, what are you interested in right now? When I mean, mine was totally the opposite way. I, I grew up as a really shy kid. I'm right down the middle of intro and extra too. And 
my parents forced me to go to public speaking in drama school when I was 14 years old. Oh my God. Because they were scared that I was too shy and I was too much of an introvert and I didn't know how to communicate. So my parents forced me to go from my school. It's an extracurricular activity. I went three times a week, oh three hours every week from ages 14 to 18. Wow. The practice, the exams, like we were examined on reading a paragraph from a book with wow. tonality and being able to bring a story to life just through words and visuals. And then being able to, there was this thing called impromptu presentations where you got a subject five minutes before you had to go in and talk about it. Love that. And you'd be able to talk about it and you couldn't say anything that wasn't true. So you had to make sure that it was all factual and whatever you did research in those five to 10, 15 minutes was right. And, and I remember doing that and I get to the end of that and I was like, oh, well, I've got this skill now, but I don't know what to use it for because that's <laughs> basically what I was like at 18. I yeah. was like, oh, so I've learned how to do public speaking. I'm now four years into my London Academy of Music, Drama and Arts, and I've got, you know, a gold medal and this, this, this. But I was like, what do I do with this? Because I had nothing to talk about. And then when I started studying philosophy from the Eastern perspective of the Vedas and the Bhagavad Gita, I was like, oh, this is what I was meant to learn it for. Wow. Like it almost like was I had a skill with no service. Sure. And, and I don't want, and that's what I'm saying there. If you're listening to this right now and you have a skill with no service, don't worry. Or if you have a service with no skill, don't worry. That's right. You know, just go and find the missing piece of the jigsaw you just gave us. Yes. This four piece jigsaw you just gave us. Chances are you probably have one of them. Yeah. And then you can go and build the other three. But don't worry about having all of them now. I think the two things that we're all working towards is a sense of peace and a sense of purpose. Peace is for yourself and purpose is for the world. And I think we all exist in both places. And I think where we go wrong is that we try to live life in an either or. And this was one of the most beautiful lessons that I learned as a monk, that life was about self and about service. There was no either or. It wasn't disconnected or divided. You couldn't live a life of complete selfishness and expect to be happy. That wouldn't work. Even if you look at like uh, hedonism, if you look at it as a philosophy of life or hedonism, however it's pronounced here, but if you look at that as a philosophy of life, which is let's just accumulate, let's just hoard, and let's just celebrate on my own, we know people and stories about people who will not be satisfied that way, to just have. You're one of them, you and Lisa, and I, can, and I can say this honestly, and I said this to Lisa the other day, are two of the most generous, loving, people and humble people that I know, despite all your success and incredible achievement. And that's what endears people to you. It's not what you have that endears people, or that may endear some people to you, <laughs> but what keeps the right people around is that you both have these human qualities because you want to serve, you want to help, you want to support and collaborate. And so for me, I feel like we either live, and then we leave the opposite. The other opposite life is, oh, life is just about giving. It's just about service. It's just about helping. That's not sustainable either. And so to me, I've discovered through real monk wisdom that life is actually embracing polarities. It's actually about doing a dance and knowing which way to go at the right time. So I believe as much in strategy as I do in sincerity. And I believe in much as generosity as I do in generating value for myself. And I believe as much in giving as I do in growing. And I think as soon as you start to say, no, it's either or, you have to choose. I think that's where we start to lose a part of ourselves. And that's why I add that compassion to passion, because I know a lot of people who do what they are passionate about, but actually lack meaning and purpose in their life because they haven't turned it into a service. I just really have had to build up rules around my social media use. You yeah. have. So my rule is never look at the phone first thing in the morning. Oh right? my gosh, I am really trying. <laughs> this is my biggest one. Like, I think if we did this, we would conquer our lives. I have now not looked at Instagram first thing in the morning. I that's just look amazing. at like the text, the email. Okay, we're okay. good. I, that's good. Yep. That's huge. It is for me. That's huge. At one point, I actually used to put my phone and my laptop locked in my car downstairs. Whoa. Because that was the only way I could truly convince myself not to look at my phone. And I think we have to go to that extent sometimes or that yeah. extremity to really yeah. push ourselves out of it. So I don't look at my phone until I go down to the gym, which is two hours after I meditate and wake mm -hmm. up and everything. So I try and avoid looking at my phone for those first two hours. And I find what that does is it gives your mind time to warm up. Mm -hmm. You don't start your mind on someone else's reactive schedule. Right. When you wake up and you look at that email and you look at that notification, you're now thinking about everything everyone wants you to do. 
not what you want to do, right? You're not thinking about who you want to be or what you want to achieve. You're thinking about, oh, Mary wants me to get that right. Mm. You know, Julie wants me to do that, right? Mm. Like whatever it is, like you start thinking about everyone else's schedule. And then the third thing that happens is, and I've said this before, but I think it's really powerful when, when you think about it. And I think about this in the morning, it really stops me. None of us, and I mean, literally none of us would let a hundred people walk into our bedroom first thing in the morning. That's true. Ever. Before doing your hair, before you doing maybe your makeup, getting clothes on, having a shower. You would never do that. But we let a hundred notifications enter our mind. That's literally try, trying to shake our consciousness awake, right? It's like really trying to wake your mind up. You're expecting your mind going from zero to 60 miles per hour in five seconds when you open up Instagram or mm. WhatsApp or emails. And it's so much pressure on our minds. That's really all it is. It's pressure and stress for your mind to have to wake up and warm up way quicker so than our true. bodies do. So that's been a huge one for me, that rule. The pressure of finding your purpose crazy. will stop you from finding your purpose. <laughs> Literally, the pressure is so heavy. And that's why it's not about finding that. It's just starting with the basics. What am I good at? And I talk about it and I break yeah, down Dharma it. in here that's and right. I talk about what are your passion? What is your expertise? What is your compassion? Because that's really important. Mm -hmm. What is your compassion for the world? Like, what problem do you want to solve? I often, people will say, there's so many things I could do. There's so many things. I'm like, my question is not what causes you the greatest joy. Sometimes my question is, what is what causes you the greatest pain? Mm -hmm. Make that your purpose. Make that your purpose. If you don't know what your joy is, you definitely know what your pain what is. What do you, you not like the news, in the world? What do you not like? And so for me. Go serve that thing. 100%. So yeah. for me, the greatest pain I see in the world is people not yeah. reaching their potential. Yeah. I that know. is it's that painful. causes me more pain because I believe that there is someone out there who is stacking shelves who has the cure to cancer. Right. There is someone out there or who's is a talented singer. Is a talented or, singer. There yeah. is someone out there who's not living to their potential, and I think we're better people, we're better partners, and we're better parents yeah. when we live to our potential. I, so that's yeah. what I'm trying to solve, and I'm not saying that's the biggest thing. Sure. I'm just saying it's my thing. How do you help people develop their strengths? and recognize what their strengths are in the first place and calm that monkey mind so that they can see clearly. This is, this is why I love Tom. You're just amazing. I mean, Tom, you're literally explaining my book for me. I'm just like, <laughs> this is like the biggest masterclass of the book. It's great. Uh, no, and, and you're spot on that the monkey mind is what we all experience every day. So the monkey mind is jumping from branch to branch it doesn't want to focus on the root of the issue. It wants to find the next banana. It wants to find the next excuse. It wants to find the next instant gratification, right? That's the monkey mind. And so the monkey mind is never going to help you focus on your strengths. And the reason, going back to one of the earlier questions you asked, the reason why we struggle to find our passion is because the world has constantly pushed us away from our strengths. Mm. We've constantly been told to focus on your weaknesses. Oh, you've got three A's and a D? You should be working on that D. Let's get that up to an A, right? I remember in my school, they had this excruciating exercise where you'd be ranked one to 180 on every subject every year. Whoa. And they'd send the list home to your parents. So there were 180 students in my year group and every subject, art, math, English, science, geography, history, you name it, you were ranked one to 180 in every subject based on your test results and scores. And that was like painful when my parents received that. And the crazy thing was I would always outperform, always in art, design, philosophy and economics, I was, and English, I was always in the top half, if not in the top quarter, if not in the top five, right, of my whole year group. And stuff like science and geography and, and math, I was kind of like in the middle and, and towards the bottom end of my year. Now granted, I went to a competitive school, so I was still okay at those things. Mm. But the interesting thing was that my parents and my friend's parents would never look at what you came one or two or three in. They'd be looking at the things you came 90, 100 and 110 in. And so we've all been programmed to say, oh, your strengths, are, they're fine, they're, they're good the way they are but why are you not performing at this? And so the one way to know your strengths is to ask yourself, what do you do that you feel the most confidence doing? And it could be something as simple as, I'm great at organizing birthday parties. <laughs> it could be, like that may be your skill, right? That may be your strength. Or it may be something like, I'm really good at putting on makeup. Or it could be that I have a great sense of fashion. It could be any of those things. 
And if you don't know it yet, you can also do an exercise where you sit down with a colleague, a family member, and a friend, because you need people from all areas of your life, mm. and you ask them, what do you think I do that I excel in, that I stand out in? Or if you could trust me to do one thing in your life for you, what would that one thing be? And when you ask that to people in a reflective way, really asking for that presence, you might be surprised by what they say. And that's such a powerful question to ask because someone may actually say something like to you, like, Jay, I think your greatest strength is just knowing what to say to me when I most need it. And you may think, well, that's not a strength you can do anything with, but it is. It is a strength that you can do a lot with if you are okay with accepting that. Of course, I want someone to say to me, oh, Jay, you're, you're, you're an athlete like Cristiano Ronaldo and you could play football and get the Ballon d'Or and win all these trips, but that's not my reality. And so I feel that that's the place that I would start with strengths. And there was a great study done on the healthy, wealthy, and wisest people in the world. And they were asked if you could invest in what you're good at, your average at, or what you're bad at, where would you put your money? And so if you take 100%, how would you divide that as a ratio? And if you ask this, I want everyone who's listening and watching at home right now to do this exercise, and you may write down 33, 33, 33, you may write down 40, 40, 20, you may write down 10, 10, 80, whatever you write down, the most healthy, wealthy, wisest, successful people on the planet will say theirs is 100 zero, zero or 80 10, 10 They go all in on their strengths because they know that if they go all in on their strengths, they can become exceptional at it. Now here's the caveat. When it comes to your hard skills, focus on your strengths. But when it comes to your soft skills, focus on your weaknesses. Now you gotta tell me which is which. Yeah, so hard skills are things like Excel, math, uh, product design, using a video camera, uh, script writing, speaking, these are all hard skills in the sense that they're uh, very clearly defined, very tangible, uh, you can really measure them. It's almost like a skill that's measurable. Your soft skills are like emotional intelligence, listening, compassion, empathy. These are all soft skills or considered soft skills. And those are where you focus on your weaknesses because they can actually end up tripping you up while you're trying to become the best at doing the hard skill. So you may be the best videographer in the world, but if you don't know how to listen to your community and your team, then no one's going to want to work with you. Mm. And so to me, that's the missing link, that we're, we're actually the other way around. We put all our emphasis on getting better at our weaknesses and our hard skills, and we think that because we're empathetic and good people, that that will be enough. And it doesn't work that way. What is faith to you? Faith to me, like the two polarities, is the day-to-day -day practices and the map. So it's the thing that's guiding every decision. Right. It's the thing that's guiding every direction that I move in. It's the thing that guides who I want to be friends with, who I want to connect with, the type of work I want to do. But then it's also what I do daily. And to me, that's what's so beautiful about faith, that it can be practical and simple, but then it can be philosophical and spiritual. Yeah. And so to me, faith is both because if I'm not practicing on a daily basis, how can it last? Right. And if it's not the governing thing behind all my decisions, then how is it true? Like, how is it real? And how me? is it your moral compass also? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So for me, it's both of those things at all times. And so it's everything I do in the morning. So my meditation practices, my prayer, the way I communicate, how I speak to my wife. Like, I think all of those things, how I speak to anyone. Right. I think all of those things are my faith. And at the same time, it's like, do I... Am I doing this out of love? Am I doing this out of service? Am I taking this decision just because it pays the bills and just because right. it makes money? Or am I doing this just because I think it will be cool? It's the same as, it's so funny you asked me this question because I was speaking to someone about you just before coming on the show today. Really? Yes. I was saying one of the things I love about Ashley and why I think we get along so well and we find it so easy to connect is because we're both have such deep faith. Yes. And I said, I always find it easier when you meet someone who has their faith and it may be different, but they're open. Yep. And then you just connect. And that's how I feel with you, that when we first started talking and meeting, I felt it straight away. The people who are really rooted in their faith, and that comes before anything else, I always connect. Yeah. Learn how to have a conversation with yourself. Ooh. Like, just learn how Ooh. to have a conversation Snap. with yourself. Like, if you don't know, if I'll give it one of the studies that I share in the book, which I absolutely love. 
uh, men and women were asked either to be alone with their thoughts for 15 minutes or they could give themselves an electric shock if they were bored. <laughs> and they, what, they took the shock. 30% of women chose an electric shock and 60% of men chose an electric shock because they didn't want to be alone with their thoughts. For 15 minutes. For 15 minutes. Why is that? Because we have not learned to have a conversation mm. with ourselves. Or even love ourselves. No, we haven't. And, and I think that starts with a conversation. Yeah. I think you're right. We don't love ourselves, but that starts with learning to talk to yourself. So find time for you to talk to your own mind, mm. to talk mm. to yourself, to understand yourself, to find out how many of us when you go to a restaurant, you know whether you're gonna go back or not, based on whether you like the food. When you watch a movie, you know whether you're gonna recommend it to your friends based on whether you liked it or not. Why do we keep visiting the same people, the same places, and doing the same projects when they don't lift us up? Mm -hmm. So many of us are not aware of the same people that we hang around with that bring us down, the places that don't feed us, they drain our energy, and the projects that don't light us up, yeah. but we keep going back there because we Why? don't talk to ourselves. Because uh, we don't talk to ourselves, because no one, like I can ask you, hey, did you like that restaurant? But when do we ask ourselves, hey, do I, do I like, do I want to hang out with that person? Does that person Do I want to be in this relationship? Do I want to be in this relationship? Do I want to be in this job? We just get scared this? of those conversations. So I think the biggest and hardest lesson is that our family and our friends will be more inspired by our example than our education. They're gonna change when they see us change. They're gonna transform when they see us genuinely transform. They're, they're, they're not fascinated by how much you've learned and how much you know and you can do a headstand now and you, know, you, can, you, know, you can do all these chakras and mudras and you know all these Sanskrit words and you know, like, that, that doesn't move the people that have known you since you were young or have known you before and that doesn't make an impact on them. What makes an impact on them is your example and your transformation and the, the amount you've changed. I remember this was really tough. So someone asked a similar question but in a, not as nicely as you did. You, you asked it very respectfully. But I remember when, when, I, was in, when I was a monk, one, this question was asked to my teacher. And my teacher's actually very compassionate, but this was one of his like heavier moments of, of like, it was harsh. Uh, but he was asked by someone in the crowd, they said to him, they said, I'm trying so hard to, you know, get my family to become spiritual and I'm doing everything and they don't listen to me and I'm trying really hard and it's not working and I'm like doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this and I'm teaching them this and I'm taking them this and nothing's happening. And my teacher said to them, and they were a student of his, and my teacher said to them, they said, he said, tolerate them as I'm tolerating you. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and so he actually said, and he's super sweet. Like my teacher's like 70 years old. He's been a monk for 40 years. He's amazing. He's one of the sweetest people in the world. And he said that, and I was like, whoa. I was like, you just got served. You know, like it was, it was one of those moments. And, and you know, he's in robes and he says it really peacefully and everything. But, but the lesson I got from that the lesson I got from that is that someone's done that for us. Like someone's been patiently waiting for me to transform, for me to grow, whether it's a mentor, a guide, a guru, a teacher, or whatever it is. Like there's someone in our life in any transformation who's also waiting for us. So part of it is patience. Patience is a huge thing. You're never gonna change someone or make them do something. And half the time you just have to get out of the way. The, the part with patience that works is introduce them to who they're inspired by, don't try and be their inspiration, right? And I often say that to, to even, even in parenting situations, like when parents introduce their kids to people they're inspired by, that will help the kids more than telling the kids to do the right thing. And, and I've seen that happen so often. When you, when you look at sports as well, like even if your father was the best actor or best sports player in the world or your mother was the best tennis player or performer or whatever it is, you're never impressed by your parents. Like we're rarely impressed by our family when we're younger. We, we get gratitude later on, but in our early days, we, we don't have that. But we need to meet people. So if you can introduce your family to people they're inspired by, that's gonna make a huge difference. And the final one, like I said at the start, was just your example. Seeing you really change, seeing your behavior change, your language change, your communication change, that's gonna give them the greatest confidence that you know what she's doing is right, it works. Right, the proof's in the pudding, the proof's in seeing you actually make that change.
Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and what is your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of actually doing something and following through. That, Believe Nation, is not enough. 35% is not enough, we gotta do something. But when you get inspired by watching a video like this and then you create a plan of action, your chances of following through jump to 91%. And when you commit publicly, like putting your comment down below with your plan, it jumps to 95%. That's what I want for you. I want you to take action. Your dreams are too important. Your life matters. Your mission has to happen. So, question of the day, your biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week, put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna celebrate alongside with you. And so what I do every day is I'll look at the plethora of options that I have available, all of the things, whether it's deals, ideas, thoughts, projects, offers, whatever it is, and on top of all of them, I'll write down why I would do that. And if the reason is often ego, pride, envy, competition, jealousy, and sometimes it's compassion, love, joy, passion, purpose, meaning, fulfillment. And so what I like to do is, I like to refine my intentions, which I class as seeds and weeds every day. So I wanna plant more seeds in the garden of my life. Seeds are things that are like compassion, love, purpose, fulfillment, meaning, joy, service. And weeds are when we do things out of ego, envy, competition. And so every day, I'm plucking out the weeds out of my life, and I'm trying to plant more seeds. How many of you want to be gardeners with me? Yeah? And I do that every day because it's so easy for me to confuse the weeds as seeds. It's so often that I've let ego grow so strong inside of me, and it took me forever to notice that was a weed. So I have to do it every day. So that's one of my biggest pieces of advice. I do it every single day. It's made a huge difference in making sure I make the right choices, the right decisions with people, places, and projects that I'm involved in. And when you refine that intention, and it gets purer and purer and purer, not that we're ever fully pure, but it gets purer and purer and purer, you'll just see magic happen around you. If you want 50 rules from Lewis Howes, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. You gotta have a dream first. You know, for me, it always starts with a dream because I can get, I can go through any adversity when I have a dream, something I'm passionate about. When I'm not excited about something, then I wanna give up.